Alrighty, so it's finally time to review the last six games that happened of match week number 17, also known as the official halfway point of the 2021 MLS season. And if you were the home team yesterday, it was a great day for you because almost every single home team were able to get a win. And coincidentally, all these home teams that got a win was by a final score of two goals to one. And if it was, wasn't for the Galaxy who could have done their diligent and and win 2-1 and could have scored a goal against the Whitecaps to make it 2-1. You know, every single game would have ended 2-1. And I think that would be the first time we've ever seen in MLS where five or more games that was happening. And in this case, six games. And all of them ended by the same scoreline. And all of them was the home team winning 2-1. Now, that being said, despite the fact that all of these games except for the last one ended 2-1. By no means all of them kind of had the, the same, same t type of game that had the outcome of a final score line of two goals to one. And we start off with the first one between the Chicago Fire versus the Red Bulls. And, you know, this game ended 2-1 because the Fire literally scored two goals in the first 10 minutes. And then they decided to kind of just shut down shop and just trying to absorb pressure for the rest of the game. And, you know, they came close of getting a clean sheet in this game if it wasn't for a very late consolation goal the Red Bulls scored. But, as I said, you know, they scored two Quick goals in the first 10 minutes. First, it happened in the second minute as Stojanovic scored from 04 to give the Fire a 1-0 lead before he would score again in the 8th minute to give the Fire a 2-0 lead. And have a little bit of a throwback of last year. Where remember last year I talked about how whenever the Chicago Fire play at home against their opposition, they always tend to have that habit of scoring early goals and especially scoring early two goals. And it happened again where they were 2-0 up against the Red Bulls. Now, in the 13th minute... Uh, Clark basically did a WWE move on Herbert's and he basically kind of just absolutely brought down Herbert's on his back. Obviously Fabian Herbert's was not ha having that and yeah, both of those guys kind of got into each other's faces. And by the way, this is really the first time I've seen Kane Clark this angry in, in the game. I mean, usually he's a relatively calm kid, but yeah, he definitely had some choice. Choice words said to Herbert's, but at the same time, Herbert's definitely had some choice words to say to Caden Clark because it was Caden Clark the one that, you know, I'm not sure you watched too much WWE, but yeah, you cannot do that in a, a soccer field. And yeah, it was also unsurprising that when when the player does that, yeah, you're going to expect the opposition that is going to get into your face. Now, uh, as the game goes on, you know, after the Red Bulls got off to a terrible start, they did start to get back into this game, but really, neither team kind of created much in the first half. In fact, oh, there wasn't even any chance that I could kind of put here on the board for the remaining of the first half. That was notable, as we do head to halftime with the Fire leading 2-0 against the Red Bulls. Now, in the 49th minute, uh, O4 with kind of a swing and a miss, despite the fact that he was completely unmarked, and the Fire almost made it. 3 nothing at there. Uh, before Herberts went through a goal and tried to chip it over Cornell, but he hits the post. But then in the 63rd minute, Turan crucially blocked Kamala shot away. I mean, that shot from Kamala was going toward goal. And if it wasn't for Turan, able to kind of almost clear that one off the line, even though he technically didn't do so, he kind of kind of blocked that shot. If it wasn't for him, that would have been 2-1 in favor of the Chicago Fire. Now in the 66th minute, Tokens blasted high and, you know, the Red Bulls definitely looking to try to get one back and try to set up a grandstand finish. Uh, but Cornell did rob Bornstein on a free header in the 70th minute before Gutmann tried to do a spectacular goal. But unfortunately, his te teammate w was pretty much in his ways, which kind of just explained the Red Bulls' day, which is, yeah, they, they just could not not finish and now it seems like their own teammate is getting in the way of their chances of scoring a goal now in the first minute of stoppage time Shuttleworth would deny Fabio there but finally in the seven minute of stoppage time the Red Bulls at least get some something for their fans to cheer about as Tom Barlow would score to to make it a one goal game but by then it was way too late for them to have any chance of of getting a dramatic second goal in deep into stoppage line. In fact, after that goal was scored, they didn't even take the kickoff. The, the referee kind of just felt like that wasn't enough. He had it. He wants to go home early. And he blew the final wh whistle right as the fire was about to kick it off after the Red Bull score, score that goal. And in the end, the fire, as I mentioned, they were able to win 2-1 in this game. And the shots in this one, nine shots for the 12 that the Red Bulls had. Four shots on goal for the three that the, the 
Fire has both team had four shots off target, two shots that was blocked by the fourth that the Red Bulls had, and possession wise, 62% possession compared to 38% possession that the Chicago Fire has in this game. And you know, for the Fire, yes, they did get a win, which is a much needed win, but I'm pretty sure Fire fans knows how this is gonna go. Where, yeah, anytime when they get a win, that means probably the next game they're gonna lose because you know that's been the inconsistent pattern that the Chicago Fire has been having this season and really for the past couple of years. But for the Red Bulls, you know, this is definitely started getting away from them because, you know, these last couple of games, they, I believe they only have, or no, they haven't even won a game. They are on actually a six-game winless run right now. And because of that, they have now find themselves, which were at one point above the red line, but now are actually below the red lines. And as I mentioned, it is starting to get away from them from potentially getting themselves back to playoff contention. But now moving on, in terms of the next match, is going to be Inter Miami and Nashville. And what do you know? Inter Miami got the win over Nashville SC for the very first time in this expansion derby. I mean, should I still call this the expansion derby? Because we already have Austin FC coming as the expanded team. But at least I would say that this is... I think we should always call this the expansion derby. Because both of these teams, of course, came into the league at the same time. And there's no doubt that Nashville, of course, have, have, have had more success so far in their short stint in MLS compared to what Inter Miami but for this game Inter Miami was get, was able to get the better of Nashville SC and kind of did something that only one other team was able to, to do against Nashville which is get a victory a, against them now 15 minutes into this game uh first of all there wasn't really a lot of chance that was happening in fact the first shot of the game came in the 15 minute when Mukta hits one that was kind of just a weak shot that goes straight to Marsman. Before Lear down, probably had the be best chance in the 26th minute as he bends that one wide from close range. Before Morgan tried to curl one in, but it goes straight to Joe Whitless. And then in the second minute of stoppage time, Karen Gibbs looked to try to get his first goal in MLS, but he pulled, he as he pulls the trigger from close range, it goes straight to Joe Willis. And unsurprisingly, the, the, the half ends with both teams unable to find a goal because... That first half was a relatively boring first half. However, that was not the case in the second half. In fact, three minutes in, we finally got ourselves the first goal of the game as CJ Sapon, who has been red hot with Nashville in these past couple of games, continued to stay on his red hot form as he scored from Mukta to give Nashville SC a 1-0 lead. Uh, Morgan looked to try to quickly respond for, for Miami, but he hits it wide from on the volley but there was no doubt that Miami was pushing for the equalizer but just as I wrote that Mukhtar almost made it 2 nothing in favor of Nashville as he puts that one wide from close range but eventually Miami does get the equalizer and it's Gonzalo Higuain who scored from Matt Tweedy to tie the game up at one apiece and as much as I know this year Higuain has given been given a lot of criticism in in terms of the way that he has played you know when you look at the stats he actually is not having a bad season I mean is he having a season that he's worth worth seven million dollar that Inter Miami paid during their 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 year coming into MLS? No, I don't think it's close. But is he as bad as what he was last season when he only, was only able to score one goal in in his, his terrible debut in MLS? Absolutely not. He has definitely improved into to this season, and in many ways, he actually has scored some big goals for Inter Miami to either keep themselves in the game or at at least have a chance to potentially win it. But in the 70th minute, um, Miami actually almost had a chance to go ahead, but Joe Willis absolutely robbed Breck Shea, who was wide open into the back back post, but unfortunately Shea just could not put that one in. Before Higuain looked to try to get his second goal in the 84th minute, but he hits it straight to Joe Willis. But there was no doubt that they were definitely pushing for a winner. But that being said, in the 88th minute, Nashville probably should have got the winner. As Kadiz basically was just left completely naked in, in the back post. I have no idea how he missed this header. Like, it's harder to miss from that, that angle than... Act, or harder to not score from that angle to than actually score, scoring it. And that miss not only would come back to, to Haw Nashville a chance to get, get the winner of the game. But it would actually cost them all three points. Because as the game looked like it was going to end in a stalemate... Indiana Vasilev scored his first ever goal in MLS from Federico Higuain to give Miami a dramatic 2-1 winner. 
And that, of course, would be the final score of this game. As the shots in this one, 15 shots per the 8 that Nashville has. 9 shots on goal per the 2 that Nashville has. Both teams had 3 shots off target. Both teams had 3 shots that was blocked. And possession-wise, 60% possession compared to 40% possession that Nashville has in this game. And there was no doubt that, you know, this, this game was probably one of the best one of the best moment and probably that goal that they score in in the last minute of this game or even the last second of the game because that was really the last kick of the game probably is right up there as one of the best moments for Inter Miami which yeah it's kind of sad that that of course is the case consider of how much they've been been struggling but hey you know they are able to finally find some positive for a year that has been mostly negative but that being said this team has started to kind of go get into a bit of bit of a, a, a unbeaten run and that you know ever since they they lost six in a row and it looked like they were heading to a downward spiral and maybe even winning the wooden spoon in their second year they've gone four games unbeaten and started to rise up in the eastern conference whereas for nashville you know this is the thing that i think is going to be a little bit concerned for nashville going for because they know that they're going to have a very tough schedule in fact uh, i heard heard that they actually have the toughest schedule out of anybody in MLS as they have tons of road game in their back part of their second half of the schedule and right now they're currently fifth in the Eastern Conference which is not a bad position but when you look at how the Eastern Conference and especially between second all the way down to 10th seems to be a, still very tight you know if Nashville does start to struggle to to get get wins or even get get draws on the road they can easily foul out the picture now that being said I, I still don't think I should totally worry about Nashville chance of making the playoffs because yeah this was kind of unfortunate that they gave up that that late goal and it's something that Nashville rarely does so I'm assuming this is just kind of a one-time thing but you just got to be worried read that that you know in the back part of the schedule knowing the fact that they have so many home games to beginning the season they know that they really need to dig deep and really maybe start to get some wins off the road because as well as Nashville has done this season on the road they've still yet to register their first win of the season and let's see whether or not if they can do that in 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 a a second half of the schedule where they're going to have tons of road games uh to, to finish off the season but now moving on in terms of the next match is going to be New England and Philly and honestly you know I talk about how in the preview I can't wait until both of these teams potentially could meet each other in the playoffs. After this game, I'm going to basically say that again, but times tenfold. Because, holy crap, this was a very entertaining game between both of these teams. And the fact that it only ended 2-1 two, two, just to show you that, yeah, both of these teams didn't really kind of have their shooting boots in this game. But that being said, you know, it was a game where it was end-to-end -end for most part there was chances that was coming in on in both end and in some way even though the union did lose this game i think they should kind of feel proud of themselves because coming into this game jim curran didn't really put his starter in this i mean knowing the fact that they do have that big concap champions league semi-final game against Copa america down in mexico you knew that he had to kind of put the kits in and i'll tell you what the kids really play well in this including one one kit it, that have that might have just got the hype train going with his first ever goal <coughs> in his MLS career in this play as <coughs> oh goodness gracious I'm I don't know why I kind of had to cough a little bit there that's not not a sign that the union of court course choked that or a, or a universal sign that somebody of course choked it in that play but anyway in the second minute of this game uh Buxa puts it wide from close range before for on the other end, Turner absolutely robs Santos as he goes goes through on goal. Matt Turner, of course, coming I mean, back as the Reds uh, stop, stop minor in this game. And there was no doubt that he basically picked off where, where he left off in the goal cup and making some incredible save in this one. Uh, then Polster would clear here Elliott header off the, the line from the corner in the 7th minute before Dewan Jones trying to go for a long-range effort, but he missed that one why but chances was really flying in for both of these teams and before i even get a chance to finish writing that we got ourselves our first goal of the game and it belongs to new england as matt poster scored from mcnamara to give the refs a one nothing lead but then nine min minutes later on the other end uh finley had a chance to tie the game up for the union but he puts a bullet right to to matt turner and the union looked like they were definitely getting themselves back 
into this game. And again, it was just so end-to-end -end early in this game. game it could have been e easily like 2-1 or even 3-2 inside the first 20 minutes. But the game would all tied up at one apiece in the 31st minute as Paxton Aronson. Yes, the young kid that I, I've been talking about, how, how he definitely has a, a great potential. And even some would say that he's even better than his brother, Brendan Aronson. Well, he definitely got the hype trick started with five, with scoring his first ever goal in his first ever start for the union as he scored from Jacob Glesnes of all people that are are on on the assist chart. I mean Jacob Glesnes has known known for scoring just absolute banger. I never thought that he would also be be an assist this can kind of playmaker but here he is able to tee tee Paxton Aronson scoring his his first ever goal in MLS to tie the game up at one apiece. But then five minutes later, Turner denied Santos as he went through on goal as the Union came all so close to turning the game on its heads and leading 2-1 in this game. But then in the 38th minute, a penalty was given to New England after Leon Flock brought down Buchanan in the box. Uh, Blake did do a great job to deny Bo from the spot, but unfortunately when he made that save, he pairs it right back into the path of Gustavo Bo, who basically easily tapped it in, and the refs were able to... To retake the lead at 2-1. And that would be the scoreline heading into halftime. Now in the second half. Blake would deny Buchanan from close range in the 49th minute. Although the Revs started the second half the better side. But that wouldn't last long. Because in the 55th minute. Turner absolutely robbed Chris Sullivan from close range. And Wagner did try to, to follow up the shot. But he puts that one night. Before in the 71st minute. Buxa goes through on goal. But Glasnes just did enough to recover in time. And as Buxo was trying to fire it in. Uh, Glasnes was there to block that one away. Uh, just eight minutes later, Tristanson puts it high from from a tight angle. Before on the other end, Shabilko hit hits a half volley that goes straight to Matt Turner. I mean, it was actually a pretty well struck in half volley from Shabilko, but Turner was there to be able to get it. And you expect the fact that you know with Matt Tur Turner, the caliber of a goalkeeper, he would make that look very routine, even though. For most goalkeeper, that is definitely not an easy and routine kind of play. Now, in the 89th minute, Tristanson tried to finish it for the refs, but he puts that one high from close range. Before in the 90th minute, the Union came oh so close on getting the equalizer as Wagner struck the post uh, from from close range. I believe it's it's on a header that he, of course, struck the post. Or actually, no, he actually shot this one, but unfortunately is denied by the post and I'm pretty sure at the end of the game the refs are definitely thanking the, that post that that saved their chance to to potentially t to give up a late goal in this game and in, in, in a 2-2 draw because in the end they were able to hold on to win 2-1 against the Union as the shots in this game 14 shots compared to 13 that the Union has 4 shots on goal compared to 6 that the Union has 5 shots off target for the 4 that the Union has 5 shots on block for the 3 that the Union has and possession-wise, 54% possession compared to 46% possession. And like I said, I really want to see this happen in the playoffs again. I mean, I know both of these teams are going to meet each other, I think, two more times. But honestly, this was just an absolute um, seesaw kind of affair. And it's unfortunate that the Union kind of came came out of this game on the sh short stick side. But like I said, you know, they should be proud of the fact that they really gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, the Rams and especially when they didn't even have their strongest lineup. I mean imagine if they do have their strongest lineup and face against the Rams. That could be a, maybe a, a bit of a different, different story but you know for New England they did what they need to do and they did what pretty much every MLS Cup contender do which is in a game where it could be a little bit seesaw saw affair they're able to come out on top at the end of the day and right now when you look at this Rams team with them just keep winning every single week you you know that this team not only is going to potentially win win the, the or finish first in the Eastern Conference. In fact, they actually have a double digit lead over second place, and they're really running away with the Eastern Conference. But they're also running away in terms of supporter shield standing, as they actually have a seven point gap uh, over SKC in terms of the supporter shield standing now. So you know this Revs team, they're definitely going to be a team that not. Only they are an MLS Cup contender, but they are definitely serious supporter shield contender with them stretching that lead in the supporter shield race. But now moving on in terms of the next match is the Quakes. You know, I really want to believe that the Quakes are going 
to be different compared to past Quake's team. And the reason why I say this is because, you know, I've seen this happen in the past where the Quakes could go on a very good run. Although I will say that, you know, this seven game unbeaten run, which is now the longest in MLS, is something I have not seen the Quakes do done in the past. But the reason why I still said that I want to believe that the Quakes can do something well uh, and don't want to believe that what I've seen in, in the past is going to be a, a sign to come is because, you know, it just feels like like maybe there could be, be a, a situation where the Quakes could start to slow down. And that I talked about throughout the season where, you know, a Mateus Almeida San Jose Earthquakes team, and really, if you want the full Mateus Almeida experience, it's basically a team that goes pretty much rock bottom, but out of nowhere got themselves back up to the top of the mountain before they basically come crashing down. And it just feels like with the Mateus Almeida experience right now, the Quakes are really right here at the top of the mountain. And I just feel like it's going to be inevitable before they start to, to go back down the, the mountain. Now, that being said, before I started to get too negative, and I know Quakes fans are probably going to be ang angry at me and said I'm a fake Quakes fan, being very pessimistic once again, saying even though they're they're going for a good run. I will say that there, there's no doubt this team have been playing much better uh, ever since they, of course, of course suffered that 3-1 loss against the Galaxy, which I thought that was really the low, lowest point for the Quakes so far this season. And what's also kind of interesting was that was the last game that Jesse Fornelli was in charge as the GM of this team. And, you know, I've said many times before, whenever there's a coaching change that is happening and an interim head coach or even a new head coach comes into a team, it immediately sparked the team and they started to go on a good run because that's what kind of the new head coach cut kind of boost would give gives you for a team that is in a bad run. But I don't think I've ever heard a situation where a new GM or even an inter GM can give a boost to the players because, you know, ever since Chris Leach kind of took over as the interim GM, which, you know, I will say that Leach have done some some good move. Um, what, A big example of that is bringing Jeremy above the seat into this team, which is something that I wouldn't think it would ever happen if Fornelli was still the GM of this team. But, you know, it's kind of weird. The fact that, that this is really the first time I've ever seen a team start to do really well, e even though they kind of kept the, their their same head coach. And also the fact that they just kind of fired their, their GM and kind of put in an interim GM, and all of a sudden, the resort started to show. Now, in the sixth minute, uh, LAFC actually had the first big chance as Oren go. I believe this is actually his first start for LAFC. Puts it wide from close range. But then Jackson Yu came probably the closest to score the opening goal as he struck the post from 19 yards out. But then in the 11th minute, that we would get ourselves our first goal of the game. As Nathan, who has just been rock solid for this Quakes team and has no doubt has all started to be becoming I mean, the, the best sign that the Quakes have had in a, a very long time. And probably one of the best, best signing so far this season. As not only he has been rock solid in the defensive end, he can also score goals. As he was able to get on the score sheet from Espinoza to give the Quakes a 1-0 lead. Now, obviously, Espinoza will dispute the fact that that one didn't take a touch off of Nathan. But, you know, at the end of the day, the scorekeeper says that Nathan just got enough of a touch. But I don't think the Quakes would care because they were up 1-0 against LAFC. Before Espinoza looking to try to get on the score sheet, but he puts it wide from a tight angle in the 18th minute. Then Jutsen launched one from long range that goes wide, but there was no doubt that the Quakes were by far the better team early in this game. And they were rewarded by that by getting the second goal of this game as Chofis would score from Espinoza to give the Quakes a 2-0 lead. Uh, Nathan had a big opportunity to score his second goal and probably should have scored his second goal and made it 3-0 in favor of the Quakes as he missed just an empty net from from close range. Uh, before, in the 34th minute, Mark Sinkowski, who has been relatively quiet in this game, he was able to deny Vela from from long range. I mean, Vela, I didn't think he had a bad game in this one, but it was also a game where it was clear that his shooting boots was not not there, and it just kind of feels like that's been the case for Carlos Vela and for LAFC, where you know ever since they suffered that 4-1 loss against SKC, where I talk about, that was a game that they didn't play, play terribly, and that scoreline didn't really represent how badly LAFC was in that game. They just could not finish and it kind of continue into this game. Now, in the 36th minute, Oringo tried to give LAFC 
a goal back, but he puts in one from close range. Uh, but there was no doubt that LAFC was looking to try to get one back, and they do. In the 39th minute, uh, Jackson Yo unfortunately score an own goal. And, you know, anytime when a dangerous ball that was coming in, and you're the defender, you're kind of in that no man's land area where you got to make sure you clear that one away because if you don't clear that one properly like what Jackson you did in this place he basically hits it into his own net and just like that LAFC were back into this game and there was no doubt momentum was with them and in the 45th minute Carlos Vela puts it high from from close range and that is kind of a shot that I think a couple of years ago Vela would definitely put that one away and I think even maybe a couple of games from Vela really started to get back to his old self he would have definitely put that one away. But it just feels like, you know, in the last game, when he was just being very frustrated, not able to put away his chances, it kind of continued into this one too. And, and and again, that was a big opportunity for him to, to get on the score sheet and tie the game up. But we had to have time with the Quakes leading 2-1 against LAFC. Now in the second half, Otwesta sails it over the bar in the free kick. Before Carlos Vela puts it straight to Mark Sankowski after just a WTF turnover from the Quakes defense. But there was no doubt that LAFC was pressing for the equalizer before Mark Sankowski absolutely robbed Latif Blessing from close range. And I gotta say, JT Mark Sankowski, you know, early this season, I was definitely at times got frustrated with JT with the way that he made a couple of mistakes that I feel, feel like a starting goalkeeper in MLS clearly should be making and also some of the de decision making and some of his position wasn't actually that good but for these last couple of games and ever since the quake got all on to a very good run he has definitely looked much much better and in some way this kind of is an indictment of his his growth as a young goalkeeper and in some way this is kind of natural for a young goalkeeper where you know when you are a young goalkeeper you're going to struggle maybe in the beginning but as you get more comfortable and especially able to get some clean sheet and not a not have to concede as much goal go as the quakes were just leaking it leaking in the early part of the season there's going to be that confident level and you can definitely see jt mark Sinkowski, he is definitely playing with a lot of confidence right now and making that big save to keep keep the quakes a 2-1 lead because that would turns out also to be a, a much more important save because you know despite the fact that the quakes were really under siege in the second half they kind of weathered the storm, and for the next 20 minutes, LAFC kind of just felt like, yeah, they knew they this was not their day again, and the Quakes kind of just shut things down, looking to try to, to hold on to this 2-1 lead. They could have made it 3-1 deep into, or not deep, but just fairly two minutes into stoppage time, as Jeremy Bosley tried to finish it off, trying to get a dream debut for the Qu Quakes, but unfortunately, he puts that one wide, and, you know, Bosley, who came on in the first half, as a, a sub which that kind of sounds weird the fact that he come off as a sub in the first half and it wasn't actually because of an injury but yeah you know i didn't think he he had a a decent game in the this one and was relatively like, quiet but i'm not going to put too much on on saying that he will see is just going to be immediately flop because it's just one game like it, it's just him to trying to get in into this this system that Almeida of course have run by the way another thing I want to say about Almeida in this game is that he decided to scrap the man marking system in this game like this is kind of the the, the first time well I wouldn't say it's the first time because I feel like Almeida this season have kind of backed off on that man marking compared to what it was when he first come to the Quakes where it was basically all man marking and it, it's basically stick to that or or we're just going to kind of ride out with with, with that plan even though things are not going well and I'm starting to see that Almeida has kind of changed it up a little bit and they're at time they haven't really exactly done the full man marking and play that chaotic kind of soccer now obviously I know if you are a neutral fan and watch the Quakes you're probably not happy the fact that Almeida decided to ban that because that's what actually make make the Quakes so enjoyable and, and really become I mean the mo most watchable team in the league but in other words you know i don't mind the fact that that the quakes decide to ban that approach and especially i said it before you know yes the quakes are fun to watch and it it, it might be fun for neutral to wa watch these kind of chaotic soccer that the quakes play but it's definitely not fun if you're a fan of 
of, of that team when they are not getting resort or being very inconsistent in terms of resort. And I feel like with Almeida started to kind of go back to kind of a tra traditional way in terms of playing kind of like zone you no know, marking instead of just going through man marking that we don't even see see it happen in the league. There also is no surprise why the Quakes have been much more st stable in the midfield and in the defense because now, you, you know, the Quakes don't have to worry about the fact that if one of their 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 player did a bad job in terms of man marking another player, then yeah, they're pretty much going to be screwed on the defensive end. And also, it kind of also is no surprise the fact that the defense have been much better with the way that since zonal marking, you know, if one of the players that that might not done a good job in terms terms of covering a guy there will always be another their guy that is there to help him out unlike in man marking that's just not going to be the case but that being said in the end the quakes were able to win 2-1 in this one as the shots of this one 15 shots for the 16 that lafc had four shots on goal for the six that lafc had seven shots off target for the eight that lafc had four shots that was blocked for the two that lafc had and possession wise 48 percent possession compared to 52 percent possession that lafc had in this game and if you're an lafc fan yeah, it, it, I think there is is definitely some huge concern and almost at the level of panicking in terms of this team because we are now halfway through the season and LAFC is sitting 7th in the Western Conference. And they also have a couple of teams that is red hot on their, their tail in terms of taking away from their final playoff spot. Like, we already talked about how this is, could be a failure of a season if LAFC don't actually win MLS Cup. But imagine if they don't make it to the playoffs. Oh boy, I, I, I guarantee you there could be some changes that could happen in this LAFC team if, if they don't make the playoffs. Because I don't think anybody would have predicted that this LAFC team, and especially with, with a team that it hasn't really been gutted like what we see with, with Atlanta, uh, with them just kind of take a big fall from grace after an incredible first couple of years into the league. You know, this team, it's still almost in some way the same same team that of course won the Supporters Shield just a couple of years ago, but... It is kind of shocking the fact that how bad things have have ter take turn for worse, and it kind of just is an example where in MLS things can change very quickly, and that just because you could be like the be best team in the league for for a couple of season, when things quickly turn on you, or if other teams start to figure out what makes you successful, if you don't ad uh, adjust or you don't make the 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 right signings after you gutted a, a team and sell them off sell a lot of your player off to Europe, you could definitely find yourself self struggling in the league. And in this in the case of LAFC, you know, it's just the fact that, that I think teams have started to figure Bob Bradley out and, and the tactics that they've been using and it's no surprise the fact that that, you know, they've been struggling because they just cannot adapt to those changes. But now moving on, in terms of the next match is gonna be DC versus Montreal and for DC, they're red hot right now. I mean, this team is just on an absolute tear in the last couple of games. And I talked about how Hearn Lasada, you know, I feel like if this DC team is going to continue to be this red hot and could maybe even get themselves near the top part of the Eastern Conference, Hearn Lasada has to be con considered to be, be the coach of the year. I mean, what he has done to this DC C team has just been nothing but spectacular. And the whole Lasada ball that DC has been been playing you know it's worked out for for them in this game even though we've seen before where i feel like a lot of team now nowadays where they decide to be be high press and decide to spend a lot of energy a lot of these team tends to kind of burn, burn out and kind of struggle so for this season now now that also is going to be 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 the time will tell whether if not dc is going to suffer that same fate but as of now this team you know they're sticking with the system and it is, has worked out perfectly and they got another three points in this game against montreal in a game where i feel like they could have won even more comfortably if they were a little bit better in terms of their finishing now in the fifth minute Ariota fires one high from from long long range uh before before Brisa was able to deny paredes in the seventh minute but DC was definitely pushing for the early opener. Uh, Brisa then denied Ariola from short range in the 14 minutes. Before in the 16 minutes, out of nowhere, Montreal was able to take the, the lead. And it's Zachary Brogiotz, the ones that, that score a, a... Or Brogiotz, who scored a rare goal, goal for him, himself 
and really just kind of score a goal against the run of play. And I also kind of wrote, Randall Leal would definitely be proud of that because he basically scored a Randall Leal as goal. Basically kind of like a, a little cross shot kind of goal that went into the back of the net, completely caught caught uh, uh, these, see, there. And, oh, God, I, I'm kind of having having a brain fart moment here. Forgot who is the DC goalkeeper because it's not, not me. Oh, it's Campen. I completely caught Campen in there there and caught, kind of caught him by surprise and just like that Montreal has a one nothing lead even though they definitely did not deserve it with the way that DC was kind of pushing now despite the fact that DC kind of maybe was a little bit shell shocked that they were down one nothing they continue to try to push to look for the equalizer Naha puts it high from 22 yards out in the 34 minute but then six minutes later he would get on the score sheet and give DC a well-deserved equalizer as he scored from Julian Gresso to tie the game up at one apiece. But then three minutes later, Montreal almost did the unthinkable again. Almost score against the run of play. And probably should have scored against the run of play. As Ibrahim basically went around the goalkeeper. And he just kind of missed wide. From, from, despite the fact that, that he had an empty net to shoot. And so far this season, I have seen some, some terrible misses from Montreal. I mean, one that, can, that I immediately bring up in my mind is the Kyoto miss earlier this season which that still to this day goes down as the worst miss so far i've seen in mls but this one is definitely going to be right up there as one of the worst miss and one of the worst that montreal has missed one because how in the world did ibrahim round the goalkeeper and he wasn't even it wasn't even a case where he round the keeper and he was in a tight angle to shoot that one in he had had a gaping goal to shoot shoot as he round the goal goalkeeper not from a tight angle and he just somehow puts it in to the side netting and left DC all off the hook at that moment and the game game remained tied at one apiece as we do head to halftime. Now in the second half, uh, Brisa then denied Gresso from close range in the 48th minute. DC picking up where they left off in the first half which is continue to dominate and look for the go ahead goal which they would get in the 54th minute as Ola Kamara, another striker that has been in red hot form, scored from Alfaro to give DC a 2-1 lead. Not long after, Nightman trying to make it 3-1 in favor of DC, but hits it straight to Breeze before Mihajevic had a rare chance for Montreal, but he puts that one wide from 16 yards out. Breeze in the 66th minute then denied Gress, so as Kamara just could not quite tap it in on the follow-up. Uh, Sebastian Breeze, of course, playing in his first game as the goalkeeper of Montreal, if I didn't mention that before. And I thought he had a great game in this one. And he was kind of unlucky. The fact that his defense kind of hung him out to try. And really the two goals that he gave up. I really can't fault him. In terms of the two goals that, that he gave up in this. And again, it's just unfortunately again on the wrong end of the scoreline. Because his defense just kind of hung him out to try during the majority part of this one. But in the 86th minute, Skunrich tried to put this game away. But he puts one wide from close range. Before Gresso tried to do the same thing. But he plays that one high from close range. But it didn't matter. Because in the end DC would win 2-1 in this one against Montreal. As the shots in this game. 18 shots compared to 6 that Montreal has. 8 shots on goal compared to 2 that Montreal has. 5 shots out, that's off target compared to 4 that Montreal has. 5 shots that was blocked compared to none that Montreal has. And possession wise 51% possession compared to 49% possession that DC had in this game. And for Montreal you know ever since that incredible 5-4 resort against FC Cincinnati a couple of weeks ago, that felt like a long time ago now because they have been winless ever since that incredible game. And yeah, you know, for Wilfred Nancy's side, he, he, his team needs to kind of pick it up a little bit because they have now dropped below the red line once again. And, you know, they aren't able to pick it up again like they did in in the, the, the majority of the first part of the season. This team can, can once again start to slide down and it kind of feels like it's almost like another Montreal type of season where this could be a team that they could be in the conversation in terms of making the playoffs and then they started to go through through a downward spiral. And it, in this case, I feel like they're having the downward spiral a little bit earlier than usual because usually the, the, the annual Montreal kind of downward spiral happened near the second part part of the second half of the season but it has now come at the half point of the season and we'll see whether or not if they can find a way to recover from that to get themselves back to where they, they were so successful especially near the middle part of the first half of the season but moving on into the last game on the sport 
is going to be the Galaxy versus the Vancouver Whitecaps. And I believe this is the last time the Galaxy is going to be playing against the Vancouver Whitecaps. Or at least they hope that that is the case because they must hate playing Vancouver right, right now. And really, for these last couple of years. Because I did say before where, for whatever reason, the Whitecaps played the Galaxy hard. And the Whitecaps in some way kind of have the Galaxy number. And in this game, you know, despite the fact that they there were times where they kind of escaped gave with the Galaxy not not doing very well in terms of the finishing. They also had a couple of chances to maybe get a get a victory again in this one against the Galaxy. Now, in the first half, there was a couple of half chances for the Galaxy, but not much really kind of trouble Craig Poe. Uh, the first real opportunity came in the 21st minute when Leggett tr hits a, a weak effort that goes straight to Craig Poe. Before four minutes later, he hit a much powerful effort from the header but this time it goes over the bar uh then bond would deny kaiseido after just kind of giving straight to to him and in some way jonathan bond really got away with a goalkeeping howler because yeah he just kind of kicked it straight to kaiseido and kaiseido just could not take advantage of that now in the 29th minute grinsair should have got the opener for the the galaxy and you talk about how bad misses this was definitely one of them and it was also kind of interesting choices when he decided to try to curl one in from five yards out like i don't think i've ever seen players ha have tried to curl one in from that close of a distance and it's there's a reason why that is the case because usually in that th that area all you need to do is just kind of put some power just just trying trying to steer that one toward goal you don't really need to try the fancy kind of curler and you know, Grand Sierra tried to do so, and it's unsurprised that one sails over the board and should have given the Galaxy a 1-0 lead. Now, thankfully, that would be forgotten just three minutes later, because in the 32nd minute, yes, it finally happened. Kevin Corbra gets on the score sheet for the Galaxy from from uh, or from or Alvarez to, get, to give the Galaxy a 1-0 lead. Almost said Caicedo there for a second. Oh, by the way, Caicedo would get on the assist chart a little bit later later just kind of a little bit of a spoiler alert alert but yeah kevin cabral finally breaking the curse and finally ended the the goal drought and you know anytime when you're a number nine and you're able to finally end it a goal drought that has to be a huge relief and now let's see whether or not if kevin cabral can start to get get things going after finally scoring his first goal and by the way the vancouver defense let's just say yeah that was that was some terrible defending there from the Whitecaps, and in some way, I think the Whitecaps just kind of didn't respect Kevin Cabral, and I, in some way, don't blame them because you know Kevin Cabral has missed some sh sh shocking sitter so far this season, and it just kind of feel like, yeah, why not go for it? Because we know you're not go going to score, but instead, Kevin Cabral basically said he had enough. He's definitely going to score from close range, and for once, he was able to bear that one away to give the Galaxy a one nothing lead. But that lead looked like it was in jeopardized just before halftime when Cavallini almost did, did a revolt and trying to go on his bike. Uh, but unfortunately, that one one just missed a little bit wide. I mean, Cavallini had tried some spectacular goal a couple of times th this season. And although that one didn't come off like most of his spectacular attempt, it did not miss by much. And the Galaxy was very fortunate to hold up on to a one nothing lead heading into the second half now unfortunately in the second half they were not so so fortunate to hold on to their one nothing lead because they immediately gave it up just five minutes into the second half it's Veselinovic scoring from Caicedo to tie the game up at one apiece and this was just classic Vancouver uh scoring from from the corner this has been one of the most dangerous team on the set piece and unsurprisingly Caicedo puts a beautiful ball into the box and Veselinovic the one that was able to to get that header in, and all of a sudden, it's all tied up at one apiece. Uh, but in the 70th minute, Craig Paul would rob Grand Sear from close range. Before two minutes later, Craig Paul actually almost committed a goalkeeping howler when the ball was coming in, and he basically spilled that one as he was trying to catch it. And it kind of goes straight into the hands of Kulubali. Now, I think for Craig Paul, it was fortunate that it ends up into a Galaxy defender because Kulubali kind of just hits it straight to to Craig Poe, who did have a good job in terms of denying him there but yeah that was hit straight straight toward him and he kind of got off the hook there but in the 81st minute on the other end uh Jonathan Bond would deny Reposo from close range before seven minutes later legit try a half volley that that would that came clo close from from going toward go if it wasn't for 
for it to be deflected wide for a corner. Before one minute later on the other end, Bond would deny goal, uh, the new number 10 for the Whitecaps who tried to chip the goalkeeper and score a dream debut goal, but it was not to be meant for him. And in the end, it ends it. So in a 1-1 draw at stoppage time, you know, there wasn't really a lot of chances for both of these teams, and it just felt like both of these teams accept the fact that they're going to share the points in this game, and that was the case. As I mentioned, 1-1 draw between the Galaxy and the Whitecaps. Shots in this one, 16 shots compared to the 10 that the, that the Whitecaps had, 5 shots on goal compared to the 6 that the Galaxy had. Both teams had 4 shots off target, 6 shots that was blocked for the 1 that the Vancouver Whitecaps had, and possession-wise, 57% possession compared to 43% possession that the Vancouver Whitecaps had in this game. And like I said, for the Galaxy, they are they probably maybe are going to be feeling relieved that this is the last time they play against the Whitecaps because it's just something about this team always causing them them, them trouble no matter how bad or how good the, the Whitecaps could be. And, you know, for the Whitecaps, that's now four straight draws that they, they have got so far this season. And in some way, they're starting to end up in the same path that the San Jose Earthquakes were a couple of weeks ago. Remember how the Quakes had a long winless run and then they started to kind of draw a lot of games before finally getting a win. Now, I'm not sure if this is going to be the same case for the Whitecaps, but if it is, then maybe that's good news because at least the Quakes are still unbeaten and, you know, maybe if you're an optimistic Whitecaps fan, you would say that this team is now four game unbeaten, but if you're a pessimistic Whitecaps fan, you would say that this team is now four game winless and they're now still sitting at the bottom of the Western Conference. But there you have it. That is pretty much it for the review of all six of these games. Let me know in the comments below what do you think of these six games. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, make sure you guys leave a like, smash the subscribe button. And yeah, I of course will see you guys next time.